In the deep dark, the Aslan are moving, but there is a darker power. There is something behind the claw. Welcome to episode 28 of the Behind the Claw podcast, a show for fans of the classic Traveller RPG. I'm Felbrig Napoleon Herriot. And let's start the show by taking a look in the email vault. Gerol, or is it Gerol, has emailed me to say he's burning his way through the previous podcasts. I have to say, I admire your stamina, my good man, but be warned, too much Felbrig can cause feelings of nausea. He has an interesting tale of discovering Traveller via an advert in a magazine. Can you imagine kids saying that these days? I mean, do kids even buy magazines anymore? He also found something I missed with regards to fuel refineries on ships. For a start, in Highgard, they're referred to as fuel purification, which is why I missed it. There's a list of fuel refinery sizes per thousand tonnes of fuel. For example, at tech level 11, a thousand tonnes of fuel would require a 35 tonne refinery. I am wondering why they included those rules in High Guard, which is all about military ships, when... Well, you'll understand when you get to the rules talk section. Ronald has got in touch to say that he's a Johnny-come-lately to Traveller. He only started playing in around 1982. He's got a couple of film recommendations for Traveller fans, and I have to admit that I've not heard of either of them. The first is called Dark Planet, and the second, Supernova. As I said, I haven't heard of them myself, but the write-ups on IMDb do suggest they'll fit the investigation-slash-mission model that'll appeal to Traveller fans. So, check them out. Thanks for the emails, chaps. You've really given me a reason to keep recording. And now, on to the first segment. I have no idea. So, computer, what can you tell me about this place? This is the My Galaxy segment, where I tell you about a planet in my Ferenus subsector. A map and planetary UPPs are available on the podcast website at behindtheclaw.blogspot.co.uk. Cobarillos is an average-sized world with a population running into the hundreds of millions, which is very surprising numbers, considering the world is not very friendly to human habitation. The atmosphere is very thin and cannot support human life. The lack of pressure actually requires use of a vac suit when on the surface. However, the temperature is very agreeable and varies little due to the planet's near-perfect circle of its orbit and the lack of any axial tilt in the planet's spin. The majority of the population live beneath the surface in tunnels and cave systems, all of which have been dug by hand by the inhabitants themselves over hundreds of generations. The people of the planet live in an odd situation. They have a homegrown level of technology that is very crude, as befits people that live in caves. They can construct basic machinery, but electronics are strictly prohibited from use or development. The prohibition comes from the colony governor, a branch of the administration from the subsector capital, Foranus. Centuries ago, the ruling family of the capital discovered this lost world and its backward population. The first meetings were very unfortunate for the representatives of the capital, as they were slaughtered by the inhabitants who, although backwards technologically, were strong and warlike. Realising that the newly discovered planet was a vast source of natural combatants, Foranus instigated an overseer regime and every year hold competitions on the planet to recruit new men for their armed forces, particularly the army. As a control measure, the planet is prohibited from developing its technology beyond steam power. This has the effect of keeping the population in the state in which it was found, and stops the population from simply going soft. Resources on the planet are at capacity and only constant warring between the various subterranean tribes keeps the population at a sustainable level. This level of violence is something that the installed troops of Foranus make no effort to stop. 
Indeed, many of the Horanus troops are the natives of the planet themselves, recruited earlier in their lives, and trained to a high degree and returned to act as guards and overseers. Culturally, the natives have developed amazing mechanical devices, but never moved onto or into electronics. These mechanical devices include man-powered surface vehicles and air compressors to fill the vehicle with a breathable air, even mechanical suits that can be worn by the individual on the surface, although they are clumsy and nothing like as comfortable as a common vac suit. Trade with the planet is strictly controlled from a series of forts dotted across the surface. There is no starport, and all visitors must report to one of the forts for trade inspections. No, no, no way. The way I heard it is that he was shipping arms, guns, you know, taking them straight in, under the navvy's nose. It's time for another story seed. When the PCs drop out of jump, they pick up a signal on their proximity detectors. This turns out to be a drifting ground-to-orbit shuttle that does not respond to hails. This, of course, represents a serious amount of credits, so should entice the PCs to investigate. The shuttle is dead in the void. The engines are out of fuel, but they will respond once more fuel is bumped in. However, the lack of power will have cleared out the computer's logs, and something is stopping the guidance controls and radio from working. The engines can be powered up, but there is no steering capability. In the cockpit is a body, and it appears to have been there for some time, perhaps years, and it is fairly well preserved by the cold. In its pocket is an ID card that suggests that the individual's name was Kyle Garner. The air is bad, and an analysis will reveal that the man must have suffocated before he froze when the power died. The dead man was unfortunate enough to have tried to blackmail an underworld boss when he discovered he was transporting illegal goods downside on his shuttle. The boss soon saw to it that Kyle had an accident. Assuming the PCs recover the shuttle, its registration and history will be discovered and the bad guy will become aware that the shuttle has been found. He will be upset and nervous about the PCs and what they might know. The boss will initially contrive a number of accidents to kill the PCs, and if this does not work, he'll hire a hitman to silence them. The PCs can use the hitman to find out who was trying to kill them, and take whatever action they deem required in this situation. There's a lot that can be done to spice up this basic idea. Perhaps the PCs do actually find something incriminating about the boss. Maybe they could try blackmailing him themselves. If they try going to the authorities, maybe they'll find that there are cops on the boss's payroll. If they take the shuttle on board and run to another system, then perhaps the owner of the shuttle might turn up and accuse them of piracy. Maybe the boss will try and recruit them into his organisation and have them running illegal guns onto low-tech worlds using that very shuttle. There are a lot of options to spin out from here. No, sir, you may not dock here. What the hell? I just made three jumps to get here. Without Permit 7C, you may not dock. Now move out to the holding line at 6,000 kilometres. This is the Rules Talk section, where I look at some aspect of the classic traveller rules or canon. Today I thought I'd search the core rule books for details of the misjump functionality, a persistent threat for all space-going travellers. From the starter edition, we learn that misjumps are rare, unless, of course, you're using unrefined fuel, in which case you have to roll 13 plus on two dice using a plus five die mod, which can make things really quite likely rather than unlikely. It goes on to say that a misjump is really unpredictable. You end up 1d6 hexes in a random direction, which could be just about anywhere. This ability to make a jump one ship suddenly capable of jumping six hexes, is really quite weird. Surely that's a feature every scientist in the Imperium would be investigating. Fueling and jumping for one-sixth of the cost would be a heck of an incentive. So anyway, back to the book, only there's nothing more in the starter book. I have noticed that in the 1977 version of Book 2, it says the misjump happens on 12+, rather than 13+, and only has a plus three for using unrefined fuel. 
but in the 1981 version of Book 2, it's 13 plus, and only a plus one for unrefined fuel. Quite a mix-up in the rules there. In the High Guard book, I found a fact that I hadn't read before. It says that military and scout ships are designed to use unrefined fuel and therefore not prone to misjump because of it. And that's about all I can find. It's very bare bones. Many of the rules in Traveller were inspired by books or films, and I'm wondering if any of you know what the inspiration for misjumps was. If you do know, please write in. Let us all know if the inspiration material can add anything to the story. Because I'm wondering if being in misjump is like riding in a 40k warp storm. Does time pass normally? Does everyone suffer hallucinations? Does everything seem normal? It seems the books, the rules books, don't tell us. Ah, damn piece of junk. Who bought this anyway? <clears throat> no, no, don't you dare say it was me. In today's review, I'm taking a look at the Adventure 02 Research Station Gamma. This book is 51 pages and is in the standard GDW layout, and it looks as if you only require the core rules to play. In this adventure, the PCs are penniless and desperate for money, and while sitting in the local inn, they find a stranger walking up to them who tells his tale, only it's a bar, and the stranger is an alien, a new type of sentient actually that's presented as part of this scenario. The lead-in for the players is that the little fellow has gold and a bunch of family held hostage. That's the opening, and a good one too. Of course, if the PCs don't care for the tale, it can be a really short adventure. The real meat of this adventure is that the alien's family have been captured and taken to a floating Imperial research station where all kinds of evil will be inflicted upon them. So even if the PCs didn't take the bait in the inn slash pub, you'll still have a cool research station environment to play in at some later date. The scenario describes the new alien race and the planet on which the adventure is set. Indeed, the whole subsector is covered lightly with planetary UPPs and a subsector map. As the adventure takes place at sea, there's also a nice section on submersibles, which in this scenario take the place of the usual space-going scout courier. The bulk of the book describes the research station and its contents. It's an original design of structure that immediately keeps things interesting. There are floor plans, room descriptions and details of the strange and weird things that can be found inside. The antagonists here are not just nasty scientists, but robots too, and some of the animals and creatures currently stuck inside the station, and to some extent the station itself becomes a problem because of its strange layout and structure. Once you've got through all that, there's also the high seas pirates to deal with, which keeps things interesting and challenging. In the classic style of gameplay, if things start to slow down, you can throw some bloodthirsty pirates into the mix. As you might have guessed, I really like what I read here. A hook to get you into the set piece, an interesting environment that you can repurpose if need be, and an alien race and of course pirates, to liven everything up. This is a great place to take your penniless PCs. Did you hear that? What the hell do you think it is? Is it dangerous? This is the Creature Catalogue, where I take a look at a creature from somewhere in the Imperium. The name Tubtree is thought to be a shortened version of Tube Tree which is a fairly accurate description of this plant. In outline, it appears as an upright trunk with two or three branches that erupt from its sides at various heights and are usually equidistantly spaced around the trunk. The tube part of the name is accurate because the trunk is a hollow tube. As the tree ages, this tube becomes wider until at something like a hundred standard years, it's about two feet across and the tube walls two or three inches thick. When viewed up close, it becomes evident that the trunk is a hollow tube rather than being solid, as it has a number of vertical slits which appear randomly across its surface. The slits can be as long as a foot or so, and about half an inch wide at their widest point. These act as traps for the unwary. 
the edges of these slits are easily pushed inwards and this forms a deathly trap for any unwary beast that pushes its head through the gap. The tub tree does not appear to trap animals on purpose as it does not have the usual digestive glands associated with carnivorous plants. But at the same time, scientists have no other explanation for the traps. The tub tree is highly toxic to human life. If chopped down, the fallen wood leaks a poisonous sap. If burnt, the fumes are toxic. Its trunk and branches are covered in spines about a quarter of an inch long, that, should they prick the skin, will raise a blister that bursts to leave a wound that will not naturally heal. The tub tree has one more feature that makes it a grave concern for settlers. It moves. Slowly, to be sure, but relentlessly. It moves through the soil by slowly growing new roots and reabsorbing others. By this method, it manages to move up to a couple of inches per day. It easily pushes through fences, knocks down small buildings, and its toxicity kills livestock. Further to that, it is an amphibious life form, and is as likely to be found crawling slowly into the sea as out of it. The lack of tides on its homeworld allows it to move into the water without fear of a surge ripping out its roots. But once submerged, it becomes a dire threat to any swimmers, and a hazard to fishermen and their nets. So I'm here. Why don't you tell me why you're cold? The spacer in the corner booth. Oh, don't stare at him. I see him. Who is he? It's the guy on the news vids. Which news vids? The thousands of channels. Crook watch. Ah, I see. This is the People of Interest segment, where I tell you about someone from the Imperium that has a bit of a rich reputation. Pelan is the second moon of Draxian, and was host to a number of colonies. The moon, unlike the planet, has an atmosphere that contains enough oxygen to make it livable with only a mask. The moon's orbit, however, was synchronised in such a way that as it orbited around Draxian, one half of the moon was in permanent darkness, turned permanently away from the sun. Entrepreneur and engineer Miss Hune Boltwright saw the dark side as an opportunity to turn a profit. He saw that there were many colonies set up on the side turned towards the light, but that the dark side was undeveloped. He decided to change that. He started by investing in an old transport ship whose jump drive needed to be replaced. Miss Hune simply pulled the jump drives out, along with pretty much everything else that he could. The removed mass was replaced with a specially manufactured mirror. The mirror was huge in breadth, but extremely thin. He purchased a swathe of land on Pilan that stretched around the dark side of the moon. He set his converted ship into a complex orbit and used the mirror to reflect sunlight onto the dark side, more particularly onto the swatch of land that he had purchased. The reflected light swept across the land three times a day, giving the land three separate hours of daylight each standard day. The shares in his company plummeted as investors knew of similar enterprises that had failed in the past. Pelan, however, was not daunted and pushed even harder along on his pet project. He subsidised a number of colonists to move onto his newly sunlit land. With such cheap rent and a partial amount of sunlight, word of mouth spread and a demand started to form for the partially lit land. This demand allowed him to charge a little higher rent for the second round of colonists. He used this to invest in a second, third, and then a fourth ship. With these ships in orbit, he was able to create a full day-night cycle over his land. This Terran-type environment caused the demand for his land to blossom, and he soon managed to start turning a profit. Misune became a hero amongst segments of society. Businessmen were amazed that he was able to turn the massive investment and early losses into a profit situation. Scientists were impressed with his complex, overlapping orbital plan that allowed his mirror ships to maintain their orbit without decaying or going erratic under solar pressure. When the success of Miss Hune's project was realised by the Megacore, they tried to copy his model, but all of them failed. The technology was not the problem, 
It was all about location and demand. Misune had recognised and taken advantage of the local orbital situation and expanding population and timed his investment perfectly. Thanks for the trade, Tuchel. It was a pleasure doing business with you. So long, sucker. And so we've reached the end game. Except, of course, that I'd like to pimp one of my own products. I've just released this month a one-shot scenario for traveller called Carla's Cruise. A massive starship, a liner, carries the Baroness Colour and her entourage to the astounding twin sons of Lyle. Secreted amongst the passengers are a bloodthirsty and heavily armed band of killers ready to target the Baroness. The PCs are all that stands between the killers and the life of everybody on board. You can find this over at Drive Through RPG. Once again, and as usual, if you have any thoughts, suggestions or questions or segment items or stories, send them in to BehindTheClaw at Outlook.com. This podcast is released on an attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Its home on the web is at BehindTheClaw.blogspot.co.uk. Music by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I'm your host, Felbrick Napoleon Harriet. Thanks for listening. Prepare for jump.